This is a All right, let me uh, try and restart that. Share. Can you guys see it now? Yep. All right. Um, I lost my PowerPoint. All right, are you guys seeing a big ax in the early church across your screen now? Okay. Yep. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, so we have a lot to go through, uh, so we'll just kind of jump into it. Um, there's a lot of reasons why you could study church history. Um, for our purposes, um, our end goal is to, to know God more and to follow and worship God better. And so our focus is really to serve the church and the purpose of the church, pursuing and um, God's kingdom. And so because of that, we'll probably, or we will focus more on theological issues as they arise in the church and how they relate to present day versus um, trying to memorize sequence of events and things of that sort. Um, most of the material or all the material is drawn from the book of Acts. And then this was uh, my textbook uh, that I used for church history and story of Christianity by uh, Justo Gonzalez, which if you guys are looking for a book to use. Uh, it's a two volume set um, and it's widely used within uh, seminaries and church uh, settings for uh, church history. So it's probably a good resource. Um, the outline for tonight, uh, we've got kind of three main areas. The first two we're going to go through pretty quickly and then camp on the third one, which is just the theological issues for the early church. Uh, but before that, we'll address uh, kind of just the question of when does church history begin? and then get some background on the first century context. Um, so the premise kind of to start with is that to really, in order to understand church history, we need to understand uh, church history in light of the whole storyline. Um, and there's a lot we could study in this regard, um, even from a just a biblical theological perspective. We just don't have time for that tonight. So we're going to try and just kind of hit the main uh, aspect of it. but. Um, let me ask you guys uh, for your response, uh, and I'm not sure how this is going to work with so many people in Zoom. We'll, we'll try it out and see how it goes. But um, when, uh, in your opinion, does church history enter into the biblical storyline? I'm not, I would say probably the best, unmute yourself and, and feel free to talk if it gets too uh, cluttered or whatever. We, we will try something else. Anyone? I was going to say, feel free to do that, or if you want to throw it in the chat. All right. I will look at the chat. So. I forget what it's called. Well, Excellent. Oh, go ahead, Joanna. Um, like after Jesus tells, like goes up into the clouds. I don't okay. know what it's called. <laughs> so uh, somebody else, I think, uh, in, in coordination with that, put Acts 2. So the idea that after Jesus' uh, resurrection is kind of when church history starts. Um, so why would you say that versus uh, any other time period in history? Just to make it confusing, let me ask, and you can throw in the question there. Um, basically, who is, who, who is, com who, uh, the church is composed of whom is the question. So I see somebody put uh, Abraham possibly because that's when uh, we first have a people of God. And so I think um, that response is connecting the concept of people of God with, uh, with the church. Church equals followers of Christ, question mark. Um, yep, so believers, right? Uh, 
the church be considered the body of Christ? If so, what the church is composed of the body of Christ? Um, yep, I would say all these answers are correct. Where it can get a little confusing is the concept of people of God. And, and even if you draw into perspective that the church is composed of believers, the idea that there was Old Testament believers. And so how does the church relate to Old Testament believers? How does it relate to uh, national Israel? Are all questions that the church in the first century was trying to figure out um, and develop theolo theological answers for. Um, for our purposes, I'm just gonna kind of give uh, some proof text, which is not the best way to do uh, biblical theology, but for our purposes tonight, just to kind of found a definition and move forward. Um, in the Gospel of Matthew, when Peter uh, gives his confession to the answer of uh, Jesus asks him, who is he? And he says, you're the Christ. And Jesus responds, he says, um, I say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And so Jesus makes a futuristic statement. He says, I will build my church. And so imply that the church has not already been built. Um, and first Peter two, nine through 11, similarly just says, uh, for once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received. So the idea that um, the church is a new um, thing that is happening in biblical history. Uh, yes, starting with uh, the ascension of Christ at, at Acts 2. Um, all right, let's move into just a quick uh, first century context. The political situation at the time was Roman was uh, in control of Asia and Europe. Um, geographically, this composed many different cultures and people groups. So Rome's uh, method of operation was to allow regional distinctions, but they wanted to uh, uh, promote peace. Um, so they uh, tried to quell any um, conflicts, uh, racial or ethnic conflicts. And so Christianity uh, during its time period can uh, conflict with Roman rule kind of in primarily two ways. Um, one, they had claims of Christ as king. And then two, um, they would have uh, what was seen as inter-ethnic uh, conflict with other Jews over this person named Crestus. And we find that in extra biblical history uh, that Claudius, an emperor uh, during the time of Acts, he expels all Jewish people from Rome because they were having this conflict over Crestus. Um, and many people think that that's what is referred to uh, later on in Acts. Um, Paul will make a, 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 or Luke will make a passing statement about the Jews being kicked out of Rome because of uh, an edict by Claudius. Um, so geographically, this is just kind of what the Roman Empire, Empire looks like at the time. Um, I'm going to do my laser pointer, but it's basically just the Mediterranean area. Um, over here is what modern day Turkey. Here's Istanbul. Um, you can see Italy there in Europe. Um, this is what uh, the Roman Empire looked like around 300 AD. The darker orange spots are kind of where Christianity had pervaded into the Roman Empire, and uh, the, the color, the yellow color outline is kind of the boundary markers of the Roman Empire, just to kind of get a, a perspective of what was going on in the world at that time. Uh, so the Jewish people were composed of um, kind of two categories, Hellenistic versus Hebraic Jews. Uh, Hebraic Jews are uh, Jews who would see themselves as uh, intent upon keeping their uh, distinctiveness from the Hellenistic culture. And Hellenistic culture just refers to Greek culture. Hellenism is kind of the Greek word for Greece or Greek. Um, Rome was the empire that succeeded the Greek empire. And so they adopted a lot of the Greek culture and Greek, Greek gods. Um, so Hebraic, Hebraic Jews saw it to be very important to keep their identity um, distinct from the Roman culture, and also pursue um, their eschatological hope of an independent nation. So in their history, a lot of times you see rebellions pop up. Uh, you probably have heard of the Maccabean Rebellion that happened roughly 100 years before Christ. Um, and likewise, other rebellions would pop up uh, during that time, even through the period of the Gospels in the early church. Um, eventually, there's uh, 
a rebellion around 70 AD. The Roman Empire, Empire comes in and quells that rebellion, and that leads to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Um, this is a simplistic view. Uh, you kind of have those two categories of Hellenistic and Hebraic, but within that, there's uh, another way to kind of slice it as four distinct groups of Jewish people, uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, and the Essenes. Pharisees, um, they would reject R Roman culture and try to maintain uh, purity by strict adherence to the law. They believed in the resurrection and the existence of angels. Sadducees uh, were considered to be a more conservative group in that they held to the temple as the center of worship. So Pharisees uh, were much more prevalent in synagogues, whereas Sadducees were in the temple. Um, but the temple was held and supported by the Roman Empire. So politically, the Sadducees uh, would work with the Romans. And because of that, they often held uh, positions of um, power and even within the religious system. So like your chief priests a lot of times would be Sadducees. Um, they rejected uh, the beliefs of the Pharisees in regards to um, resurrection and angels. They kind of saw that as a, an innovation. Um, zealots, like the Pharisees, um, tried to maintain a, uh, their Jewish identity, but they were more political orientated than religiously orientated. Um, and so their focus was on gaining political autonomy from Rome. And the Essenes, um, they also uh, sought to obey the law, but they did so by kind of withdrawing from society. Um, and their kind of claim to fame is that uh, that's the group that is attributed to writing the Dead Sea Scrolls from which we get a lot of uh, archeological information. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, history and scripture. Um, we have the biblical texts, and then we have extra biblical documents that kind of inform us of the time period. And I want to make sure that as we uh, study, study the Bible and study Christianity, we weight each up, uh, appropriately. And I think one potential issue is to give too much weight to extra biblical historical information. And just a concrete example of that is uh, a movement in modern day Christianity, um, often referred to the new perspective of Paul. And that's a wide dynamic. And so in no ways does this one aspect uh, totally encompass what they're about. But one of the predominant elements within that movement is the idea that um, Christianity at the time of Jesus and the time of Acts was not interested in the concept of individual salvation. And, <clears throat> and the way that they come to this conclusion is that they first go to extra biblical historical documents to try and study the culture at its time to discern what was on the minds of people of, of the day. And by studying those documents, they assert that they find no evidence for people asking questions about individual salvation. And so they form that as a presupposition before they come to the actual biblical text. So before they ever read any biblical document, they start with the idea that whatever we read in Acts and in the epistles, it cannot uh, be about the concept or the question of individual salvation, because that just wasn't a question of the time period. If we think it is, they would assert it's uh, modern readers reading their Western culture back into the text versus the text itself. The problem with that is uh, kind of twofold. One is the biblical text itself, I would, assert contains very clear evidence that people in the time period were interested in individual salvation. You have the rich young ruler, for example, who comes to Jesus and um, asks the question, what must I do to be saved? And so the other problem with that, that if we go to extra biblical text and allow that to determine the content of what the Bible can or cannot say, then we've already, um, basically neutered the Bible from being able to speak into our lives. So when you show up on Sunday uh, to a sermon, oftentimes the, the preacher's um, agenda is not to um, necessarily uh, take up uh, topics that you're interested in or the congregation would be interested in for, from the pew, but rather speak into their lives and bring them back to God's orientated view of what is important. And so if we, 
use extra biblical texts to set the precedent that doesn't allow the biblical text to, to speak in. Um, last point on history and scripture. Uh, so we have Acts and later history and kind of off of the first bullet point is just Acts is inerrant inspired history. And so it carries much greater weight than uh, later historical documents that we'll find. Um, all right, so let's jump into theological issues within the early church. And the first one that uh, I want to look at is just um, the idea that the church uh, basically uh, has to apologetically argue for Jesus and his church as the fulfillment of Old Testament promises to the fathers. That's like a major theological objective we find within the church um, at the beginning. And so um, we find uh, sermons that address this topic, two predominant ones is Peter's first sermon in Acts 2, which is given at Pentecost. And then uh, we have Paul's kind of first recorded sermon. It's not the first sermon he gives, but the first one that Luke actually records in detail in Acts 13. And that's one of the passages that I had you guys read for homework. And so we'll take a look at that in just a moment. Um, the thing I want to, before moving on, just kind of point out about Acts is, so right from the get-go, after Jesus' resurrection, we have Peter in Jerusalem. Uh, Jews from all over the Roman Empire are gathered at Jerusalem for Pentecost, and Jesus gives his first sermon. And so um, we find that uh, God is orchestrated from the beginning, just the start in the small town of Jerusalem, and allows for this... Uh, new faith or this faith with a new understanding to, to spread immediately beyond the boundaries of Jerusalem. And so if we just look at a map that kind of describes different geographical areas mentioned in that uh, Acts 2 sermon, we see it going you know, throughout the Roman Empire. Here's Italy and Rome. This is Turkey. And this is over in the kind of the Arab countries. All right. Uh, so Acts 13, 16 through 47. Um, it's a long text, and I kind of want to freshen your guys' mind. So I'm going to give you um, about six minutes just to kind of quickly read through that text again. Uh, you don't need to read through it in detail. Just get it fresh in your mind. We're going to concentrate more on verses 26 through uh, 41. So I would say um, I actually – time I have is 635, so roughly um, – I'd say 641, 642 will come back and just answer these three three questions. Should I send them into breakouts? Um, you know, I I was not planning on uh, breakouts. Uh, no, yeah, let's not. Uh, we'll just okay. go through this as a, as a group. Okay.
All right, if uh, anybody needs more time, just uh, say something in group chat real quick and we'll give you an extra minute. All right, it looks like we're, we're good to go. Um, so uh, whether in group chat or if you wanna put on your mic, um, what is Paul trying to convince his audience of basically in this, this message? The plain, simple, obvious answer. If you were just to kind of summarize it in a quick point, what what's his intention? God has fulfilled his promise to his people through Jesus. Yep, I like that. Basically, simply, Jesus is the Messiah. So in a lot of ways, what's happening in this first century context is something similar to um, like the, the movie Sixth Sense or uh, the book of Eli. You kind of, you watch this movie and then you're, you've been watching it at the end, some, some fact or reality is revealed and you can't believe it. It's kind of like a, no, wait, no way. There's no way this could be true. And you have to go back and rewatch the whole movie to see if the storyline in fact holds up. Um, in a lot of ways, that's what Paul and the early first century apostles are doing for their audiences. They're speaking to people who know these texts really well, and they're going back and rereading the storyline for them to try and help. Uh, them see that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah that was promised. Uh, all right. Uh, I want to hone in just a little bit on verses 33 through 37. Um, I'm going to read verses 33 here first. Um, Paul says that God has fulfilled this promise to our children and that he raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So what is Paul's specific point in verse 33? This is not as obvious. At least it may not be. Maybe it is to some. But. Rhetorically, what is Paul doing when he uh, quotes Psalm 2? What is his assertion? What is this? What is basically uh, that his son is Jesus? Yes. What is the significance of the words as it is written, as it is also written? That this was predestined, fulfills prophecy. Yeah, exactly. It fulfills prophecy. So his previous statement is basically he's saying it's being fulfilled by the Psalm 2 quote. And so his previous statement is that um, God has fulfilled his promise to our children and that he raised Jesus up. And so um, he's tying Psalm 2 to his previous statement. What event is Paul connecting to Psalm 2? What is the phrase, he raised him up, reference? I, I, yeah, I should maybe just say it. it his resurrection. It, Paul is tying Jesus' resurrection to this Psalm 2. So Jesus is raised from the dead, and he's saying, as it was fulfilled in Psalm 2. What is significant about Psalm 2? Does anybody know its place within Israelite culture? If you took Mark's study, you might have been exposed to this. But Psalm 2 
is basically, it's a Davidic Psalm and it was uh, read at the coronation of Israelite kings. And so Jesus is saying, or Paul is saying, uh, God raised Jesus from the dead in fulfillment of the promises to our fathers as it is written. And then he quotes this Psalm that is read at the coronation of Israelite kings. And so by doing that, Paul is basically making the assertion that Jesus is installed as the Israelite king at his resurrection. That's when Jesus comes into power as, as the Israelite king. Um, verses 34 through 37, I'm going to read those real quickly. It says, as for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and laid among his fathers and underwent decay. Uh, but he whom God raised did not undergo decay. And so in these verses, Paul is basically trying to uh, make the assertion to his audience that, um, that the Messiah would be raised from the dead was always in the Old Testament prophecies. And he's doing that by bringing them back to David and showing them where David makes the assertion that God's Holy One will not undergo decay. He, and he makes the argument that that's not talking about David. And we know this because David did undergo decay. But that David makes this assertion, therefore, means that the Messiah had to rise from the, from the dead. That this was always contained within Israelite scripture. And this was unexpected. This was not something that the Jewish culture in its uh, day or time was expecting to see of, of the Messiah. Um, all right. Uh, oh, yeah. So um, we have uh, kind of that Acts 2 event. Um, some major, another major event is uh, in Acts 8, we have Paul on the scene for the first time as Saul. Uh, he's not yet converted, and he's persecuting the the Jews. Uh, <laughs> I see Paul Stiver cheering. I was wondering what was going on. Um, and that's basically, if you look at the map, um, the church is in Jerusalem at the time. Paul kills uh, Stephen and starts persecuting the church, and that causes them to spread out into the areas of Judea and up into Samaria, so up in here. And even some go all the way up to, to Antioch and start a church up there. And we read that later on, Barnabas goes up to Antioch. And after Paul has had his conversion, he's hanging out in Tarsus. Uh, Barnabas goes over to Tarsus and brings Paul back to Antioch. And so that's where Paul is, is at in Acts 13. Um, and Paul is there with the elders and they're praying. And God, uh, by his Holy Spirit, tells the elders to set aside Paul and Barnabas to send them out uh, for the mission that he's uh, called them to, which is basically to take the gospel out beyond just this initial region. And so we have Paul going on his first missionary journey, which is following kind of this black line uh, where he comes back to Antioch and then later goes on a second missionary journey, which is this red line coming all the way over, um, not over to Rome yet, but over uh, on the other side of kind of Istanbul. Um, I guess I don't know the European countries at the time right now, but um, comes back uh, and then shortly after that decides to go back, re-encouraging the churches that he had already visited, seeing how they're doing, uh, appointing elders, um, and comes back, always coming back to Antioch is kind of his home station. And then this last green uh, kind of voyage here is indicating Paul's journey to Rome. So this wasn't an a intended missionary journey but rather just Paul um, appealing to Caesar after he's been uh, accused of a crime. He appeals to Caesar to plead his case, and he's brought to Rome. That's kind of where Acts ends up. And so you kind of see within the storyline um, the gospel message being spread out from Jerusalem, not by any planning by the apostles or any strategizing of the church. This is all God's initiation. You have initially... Uh, the apostles and disciples being persecuted. And so they just flee out of Jerusalem. And as a result, the gospel message uh, goes out. And then the Holy Spirit himself uh, 
initiates with the elders at the Antioch church and calls them to set aside Paul and Barnabas. So uh, Luke is communicating through Acts that what is happening, this um, advance of Jesus's kingdom through the church is all brought up about by God's initiative and not um, the strategy or plan of man. All right. Um, so the second aspect I want to quickly look at is how does Jesus or how does Paul see um, his missionary uh, venture in light of the OT promises? So for that, I want to focus on uh, Romans one through six, um, just to, yeah, facilitate this going quickly. I think it probably will work better if I just read um, read the text instead of having volunteers. Um, so Romans 1 through 6, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through the prophets and the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who is born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who is declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the call of Jesus Christ. And so the first thing I just kind of want to point out is uh, this is the uh, prologue to the book of Romans. It's Paul's uh, longest prologue. The book of Romans is really Paul's theological treatise and where he is uh, really in full reinterpreting the storyline in light of what he calls his gospel or God's gospel of salvation by faith. And so he's going in Romans, he's going to go back through and look at the storyline and argue how it's always been that believers were saved by faith. And he's going to go back to the beginning of the Israelite storyline with Abraham. He's going to address David. Um, he's even going to go back to the, to the history of mankind and show how it's been true from the very beginning, uh, starting at Adam. And he does that in, in Romans chapter five. And so for Paul, it's very important for him before he launches into this, to connect his gospel back into the scriptures, just like he did in that Acts passage. And so I have here just highlighted for you guys in, in white, um, kind of the corresponding language between the Romans 1 through 5 passage and the Acts 13 passage. So you can see how there's heavy uh, semantic overlap. And what that helps us with is to, to really see um, Acts 13 is explained in more detail and more ver verbosely. And we can see those elements packed into Paul's prologue in Romans in a very uh, succinct way. And so we have him highlighting the, uh, the gospel of God, uh, which is connected to the promises made to the fathers. We have prophets obviously referring back to the scriptures themselves. He uh, mentions the descendant of David, which was the uh, foremost aspect of the Messiah that was the promised one that was to come. Um, and he picks up this uh, resurrection from the dead again, which he brought up in that Acts passage, which was a very uh, new distinctive thing for um, the Jews to understand about, about the Messiah. Um, however, he goes beyond the Acts passage in that he, he mentions this um, obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. And so I just want to quickly uh, take a look at a couple of the Messianic passages that tie back into this biblical storyline about the Messiah and the nations. And so uh, the three passages we'll look at is Psalms 2, uh, Isaiah chapter 11, and there's four servant song, song, uh, songs in Isaiah, one of them being uh, Isaiah chapter 47, which we'll look at. So uh, Psalm 2, um, I'm not going to read it all for us just so that we can get through more material, but you see him connected in the psalm to his anointed which um, Messiah in, is the Hebrew word for anointed one. And so this is talking about the uh, Jewish coming Messiah. And that was well recognized even outside of Christianity. And it says, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. So we have this Messiah figure who's going to actually end up ruling not just over Israel, but over the nations. And uh, the weapon that's going to kind of facilitate this is the, the rod of iron. So uh, 
The next passage is this Isaiah 1 through 5. Um, again, he connects it to David. Uh, it starts out with the shoot, a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. Jesse's just the father of David. Um, but then he goes into the characteristics of this shoot from Jesse. He says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of strength, the spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. And so in the Jewish understanding of the Messiah that was going to come, he was going to be the figure that had the Holy Spirit par excellence more than any other one. And he was going to distribute these characteristics in his, uh, in his kingship. And later on in this passage, we again see this reference to uh, the whole earth, which is inclusive of uh, Jews and Gentiles. Uh, it says he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And so in Psalm 2, we had rod of iron, and now it's kind of transformed a little bit to this rod of his, of his mouth. In Isaiah 49, 1 through 7, um, again, we have this reference of the Messiah to the nations, and we have this uh, kind of uh, weapon that's going to be instrumental in this. And he says, he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. And later on, it says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation <clears throat> may reach to the end of the earth. And so we go from Psalm 2 with this rod of iron to Isaiah 11, it's rod of his mouth. And now in Isaiah 49, we have mouth like a sharp sword, kind of all referring to this uh, weapon that the Messiah is going to use to bring about um, this rulership over the nations. And so uh, these four quotes are from Revelation, which obviously is uh, after um, Acts is written. But we have uh, John giving his uh, theological interpretation of the significance of these statements. And I'm just going to uh, hone in on uh, Revelation 19.15 here. He says, from his mouth, and so this is talking about that Messiah again, comes a sharp sword so that with it it may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And so you see him picking up that language from uh, Psalm 2, the rod of iron, in Isaiah um, 49, this sharp sword from the mouth, and he's kind of connecting them two as one in this role of ruling over the nations. And so if we bring that knowledge, um, whoops, and we come back to this Romans 1-6 passage and see what Paul is doing, He's delineating this Messiah figure, this descendant of David according to the flesh, declared the Son of God, um, this phrase, with power by the resurrection from the dead, could be translated, and I would say in light of what we saw in Acts 13, should be translated, um, in power. So he was declared the Son of God in power, meaning he's now instituted as the king. He's now ascended into power. And instead of by the resurrection from the dead, it can also be translated at the resurrection from the dead. So Paul is asserting that this Davidic king has been enthroned in power at his resurrection. Um, according to the spirit of holiness. So he's tapping into this Isaiah 11 kind of concept where the Messiah is going to have the spirit par excellence. Um, and he names Jesus Christ, through whom we receive grace and apostasy to bring about the obedience of faith among the Gentiles for his name's sake. And so here we see Paul basically seeing all these Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah ruling over the nations. He's saying that's coming to fulfillment as I and Barnabas go out and take this gospel message all around to this Roman Empire and all these Gentile uh, people are coming to faith. This is bringing about the obedience of faith of the Gentile nations to this messianic king. And so what is this rod of iron, this, sh this sharp sword that's coming from the mouth of the Messiah in that was prophesied about how is it actually coming about in reality? It's Paul's gospel message. This is the weapon that is wielded by the Messiah to bring about the obedience of, of the nations. And so Paul sees his mission as he's going forth with his gospel, fulfilling this whole Old Testament storyline that was the hope of the Jewish people. Um, so I want to kind of bring it to... Uh, What's the um, significance of this for the present-day church? How do we relate to Paul's missionary journeys in the biblical story? Um, if you guys want to throw some answers in the group chat, I'll take a look.
plant churches. Yes, definitely, right? So uh, as we plant churches locally, we are carrying out this, this idea of the Messianic King moving out into the world and uh, establishing his rule over Gentile nations. Uh, and as we plant churches globally, right, as we go out into unreached areas of the world, uh, there's places the scripture talks about in Isaiah, every tribe, tongue, and nation will come to know this messianic king. And so we have this uh, mandate or this mission as a church to go and carry this gospel message all over the world to bring about the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies. And so as it stands, you know, present day, we have not brought about the fulfill the complete fulfillment of those Old Testament prophecies. And so we engage as a church with a mission to carry on uh, what was started in that, in that Acts church to kind of put a um, larger kind of biblical theological uh, bow around it. If you look in the Bible, a lot of times God tries to make things really simple for us. He divides things between old and new. So we have old creation and we have new creation. We have the old covenant that kind of rules over old creation. It's the means by which old creation relates to God. And then we have the new covenant, which is really the covenant that uh, determines how new creation relates to God. And so in scripture, we have in Genesis 126, this is often called the creation mandate. Um, and that this is God giving a command to Adam and Eve. And he says, be fruitful and multiply, fulfill the earth and subdue it. <laughs> But this creation mandate is given to the first creation, or what I would call old creation, physical uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. And so we find its corollary in Matthew 28, 16 through 20, where Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. And he says, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe, observe all that I've commanded you. So Jesus' command is, go, be fruitful, and multiply. But the fruit they're bearing is not uh, old creation beings. It's creating new creation beings, right? New disciples. And so this is really the exact kind of analogy to what was given in the Genesis text, uh, be fruitful, and multiply, and subdue the earth. Jesus is saying, go forth, make new creation beings, and multiply the earth with new creation beings, i.e. my disciples. And so that's the mission of the church that we take on. <clears throat> All right, uh, kind of the second big issue, um, which we're going to go through uh, fairly quickly just because of time, is um, Jews and Gentiles. So from the storyline, or in your homework, I had you read some texts, um, the Exodus 19, uh, 1 through 6, Deuteronomy 7, 6, those listed there on, on the screen. Uh, real quickly, just based on those texts, what was Israel's promised destiny or place among the nations? Who was primarily seen as the benefit of God's salvation? This was from your homework assignment. Uh, so Eric Dave says, to be set apart, reflect God to the world, to love, obey, represent, special and set apart. Yeah. Israel is special and set apart right from the nations. It seems like the focus of God's salvation is strictly among the Jewish people. If you're just looking at just these verses. So for example, Deuteronomy 7, 6 says, uh, for you are a holy people to the Lord, your God. The Lord, your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And so, um, there was this common misunderstanding among the Jewish people that God's salvation was only ever meant for the, for the Jewish people and not, was not going to go out among the Gentiles. Uh, but you find God, again, taking initiative in the Acts narrative. In Acts 10, he comes to Peter in a vision with the uh, food coming down. He says, take up and eat. And Peter says, you know, I'm not going to eat of anything unclean. And God says, don't declare unclean what I have made clean. And then uh, the people come from Cornelius, who's also seen the vision, and they come to get Peter to, to bring him to Cornelius, who's a Gentile, God feared, to hear the gospel message, which Peter shares with him. And Cornelius hears and believes, along with his family and servants with him, 
and they receive the Holy Spirit, which is uh, evidence of God's salvation. And so Peter brings us back to the church in Jerusalem and reports what happens, and they all agree and say, so then salvation is meant for the Gentiles as well. We've seen proof of it in that they've received uh, the Holy Spirit. And so they say, truly, uh, anyone, anyone who calls upon his name will be saved. And so um, God is taking his uh, scope of salvation outside of Israel to the Gentile people now. And so that brings up a couple of theological issues within the churches. Why? And why now? And how do the uh, Gentiles fit within the Jewish, uh, within the storyline? Um, and I, we're not going to read through them again, just because of time. I'll leave that kind of as a homework uh, follow up. But Ephesians two eleven through twelve, Paul is writing a Gentile church, and uh, he's talking about formerly you were cut off from God, but now you've been brought near. And so he's describing to them what what God had planned and discerned in the storyline. And another place where we see that is uh, Romans eleven twenty five through thirty two where again, Paul is primarily in this short passage uh, addressing Gentile believers and telling them not to be arrogant against their Jewish believers just because it's seemingly like more Gentiles are coming to faith. And he kind of gives a description of, of why it is that this is, is going on. And the short of it is, is so that God might show mercy to all and that all might be shown to be in need of mercy, both Jews and Gentiles. Again, this is kind of a big theological question for the church and to really study and get at uh, the church's response. This is something you'd take up in a biblical theology course. Um, so I, I know you guys are going to go through like a new Testament survey. Um, these are kind of topics that you will uh, bring up because it's going to come up in acts and in, in the epistles. Um, also is uh, that kind of occurs with this Jew Gentile thing is not just the theological question but also just kind of the tension between the different cultures. And as they're in church uh, uh, communities that are the same in practicing different um, cultural aspects. And so you see that, for example, in Romans 14 and 15, where Paul is uh, commending the Gentile bel believers to not take advantage of the freedom that they have to just eat anything they want, because in taking advantage of that, they're causing some of their Jewish brethren to also partake of these foods, which because of their cultural background, they just don't feel uh, like it's okay for them yet. And it's causing a stumbling block in their conscience. And Paul basically makes the assertion, even though these Jewish people are free to eat of this food, because they're not doing it out of faith, it ends up being sin for them. And so basically commending the, the Gentiles to not take advantage of the liberty that they have. Uh, for the sake of their Jewish brethren, who, get, who Christ has also died for. Um, so that's just another big aspect that we find going on uh, within the first century church. Um, the last uh, kind of within the church area thing that we're going to look at is um, the whole theological issue of justified by faith and not by works. And so, again, I gave... Um, some homework assignments around this. Um, I had you read some Old Testament texts. And so uh, this Genesis 17, one through 14 text, I had you read. If you need to, you can kind of refresh yourself, but um, I'm just gonna kind of leave these questions on the screen and have you guys uh, post answers um, in the group chat and I'll just kind of flush them out and talk about them. So, um, Basically, the idea or question that you're at, at trying to answer from this Genesis 17, 1 through 14, is from that text, what role or function is circumcision playing with regard to the Abrahamic covenant? And what are the stipulations for man's involvement in that covenant, i.e. The, the Abrahamic covenant? And then that third question is, how does this uh, kind of relate to the concept that you've been taught it, that happens in the New Testament, this idea of justification by faith and, and not by works. So I'll just kind of wait for people to post some answers in the group chat.
Okay, so Lindsay says, by the act of circumcision, they become a part of the chosen people, recipients of the promise. It's a physical reminder that they are God's chosen people. The Old Testament covenant was symbolized through a change in flesh works in the New Testament have a change in the heart or spirit. Um, another statement, they must be Israelites or owned by Israelites. Yeah, so who, who was it that was going to get circumcised? Yeah, so uh, I'm just going to read a couple of the statements here um, to try and just emphasize uh, kind of the, the stiffness of the language. Um, God says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generation for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. God said further to Abraham, now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, uh, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. So he says to him, every male shall be circumcised, you and your descendants after you throughout the generations. So not just the first generation, but throughout the generations. Uh, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So um, we find a very stark statement about God's role for circumcision with regards to the Abrahamic promises. So we've looked at earlier how Paul has been arguing that what's going on in this first century context is the fulfillment of those promises. God has told Abraham this should happen for you and your descendants throughout your generations. So I'm going to leave it at there. We'll come back to that text. Uh, Deuteronomy 30. That was another major text that I wanted you guys to read. Um, so feel free to look back at it if you need to, but from your notes, your homework, if you can just throw back into the group chat. Uh, just answer that top question from the text. How will Israel regain entrance into the land once they've been kicked out? By returning to the Lord, verses 2 through 10. Yep, what does that look like? in obedience and repentance. So if I read uh, verse 10, kind of the one I call out there, it starts with a condition, right? It says, if you obey the Lord, your God, to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, if you turn to the Lord, your God, with all your heart and soul. And so basically this passage, if you read through it within Israel's storyline, uh, God sets up this requirement of how Israel was going to get back into the land. And it was going to be by keeping his Mosaic covenant, the covenant uh, which contained the commands that they broke, which was the reason that they got kicked out of the land. And so you see, for example, in Nehemiah, uh, if you, uh, we went through that as a church maybe a, a year ago, Nehemiah chapter one makes specific references back to this Deuteronomy 30 requirement of how it is that Israel is going to get back in the land. And so that's why you find the Pharisees being very adamant about teaching and pressing the Israelite people to keep the law because they were out, they didn't have control of the Palestinian territory. Rome was in control. And how was it 
that Israel was going to regain control of the land. It was by obedience and meeting the requirement of the law. And they, they can point back to that as the answer in Deuteronomy 30. So um, that kind of raises some tension. So we come to first century Acts Church, and we find that um, as Paul and Barnabas are going out communicating the gospel, um, they'll go into these cities, and after they've come there, uh, this group of Jews, often kind of called Judaizers, um, will come up, come into this this town, and these Judaizers are asserting that Jesus, yes, he is the Messiah, but they're also asserting, hey, look at our look at our texts. It is necessary to not just believe in Jesus as Messiah, but it's also necessary to get circumcised and to obey everything commanded in the Mosaic law. And I can point to Genesis 17, and I can point to Deuteronomy 30 to prove that for you. Um, so this becomes an issue within the first century church. And we kind of read about that in Acts 15, um, where Paul goes back to Jerusalem and they have what's kind of commonly referred to um, the Jerusalem Council. And so that's the big issue, that kind of that first question I have there, what seems to be the big issue among the New Testament church? And you can understand that in light of the text that we just read, because if you just go to just those texts, we're not reading them in light of the whole storyline, it would seem like that is what is commanded, and that is the way that Israel is going, going to enjoy God's blessings and have the promises fulfilled. But what is the New Testament church's answer regarding these issues? What happens in Acts 15? What, what is their final word in regards to, do the Gentiles have to get circumcised? And do they have to obey um, the commands of Moses? So that would be Acts 15, 5, it says, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. And then Peter gets up and responds. Um, all right, so I'm going to look at chat here. Why were women coming up here? Okay. We'll maybe address that women question later. Uh, it's a good question, uh, just to kind of keep our focus on the discussion now. Um, what is, what is Peter's answer at this Jerusalem council to, is it necessary for Gentiles to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses? So in verse 7, it says, Peter stood up to them and said, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. So Peter starts out with the premise, the presupposition that is all agreed upon, even the Judaizers. Gentiles are being saved. So the question is not whether Gentiles can be saved. The question is, how is it that they're going to be saved? So um, I see somebody mentions verse 11 there, so I'll, I'll point that out as I get to it. Um, so Peter stands up and says this, and then it says, uh, verse 8, And God, who knows the heart, and testified uh, to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. So again, that was what we talked about before, how it was that it was confirmed that they actually were saved. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts. Now, therefore... Why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear, but we believe that we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus in the same way as they are also? So yes, definitively, verse 11 says how they are saved through the grace um, of the Lord Jesus in the same way as we are also. 
But I want to point out, because there's um, some disagreement within modern day church as far as like what, what is exactly the issue here? Um, what is being addressed? Um, one side will assert that the issue is just about kind of these um, ID badges or boundary markers that kind of identified people as Jewish versus being Gentile. And so those would be like Sabbath keeping, uh, food laws, circumcision, and that, that really the question that's going on in this Jerusalem council is just whether it's necessary for these Gentiles to take on these Jewish ID markers in order to participate in this community. What I want us to focus on is to see that that is uh, not the issue that's going on in the Jerusalem council. Uh, and we can see that clearly in that before verse 11, Peter says to them, he says, now therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples, i.e. the Gentiles, a yoke which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear? So the question is, um, what is it that them nor the fathers were able to bear? And if you look at the history, they were very much able to bear the ID markers. That was easy. It was easy to get circumcised. It was easy to keep Sabbath keeping in the Pharisees' days. It was easy to keep the food laws. The things that the Israelites couldn't keep, that neither their fathers nor they could keep, that David couldn't keep, was the ethical standards, the requirement within the law that was uh, delineated in order for them to experience the blessings of God. And so the, th the question that's at the core of this Jerusalem council is whether it is necessary to do the ethical requirement of the law in order to be saved, or is our salvation happening some, some other way? Um, so what significance does that have uh, for the church today? This, this idea of justified by faith and not by works. I'll kind of look to group chat for maybe a couple. What, okay, what was the question? Yeah, what, what significance does this theological issue of justified by faith and not by works have for the church today? So there's this historical discussion that's happening in the first century church. They're trying to figure out how is it that we're saved? Basically, we have all this old covenant commands and uh, literature that gives uh, this instruction about how it was that Israel is going to get back into the land. And now we come and we find out that there's this new covenant and there's seemingly this contradiction or this tension with the old covenant. And there, that first century church is trying to figure out, well, what is the significance then of the old covenant? Why the law? Paul asks in Galatians 3, he brings up for his reader, he goes, why the law then? And then he'll go into this uh, dialogue in this explanation in the biblical storyline like why is it there um, so there's, there's this question in the first century church of why the old covenant how does it relate to the new covenant what was God doing um, all right so uh, somebody says puts our salvation solely on what Jesus did on the cross as somebody else says if we're saved by works no need for Jesus right Exactly. The New Testament would say that we're saved by Jesus' fulfillment of the law and by his works. We don't bring any works to the table. Exactly right. So how is it that that Deuteronomy 30 requirement is being met? Uh, go and look in your uh, Romans chapter 10, and Paul is actually going to address that Deuteronomy 30 text. He's going to allude to it, and he's basically going to say, it's not by us fulfilling the requirements but rather it's by Jesus fulfilling the Deuteronomy 30 requirements. Granted, the language he uses there is uh, a little bit poetical, and it's uh, kind of have to read in the context of the whole letter to understand what he's trying to get at there. But he's alluding to this Deuteronomy 30 text, and he's basically saying, yes, 
I'm not getting rid of that Deuteronomy 30 requirement that the law be met. It was a strict, hard, fast requirement. And that is how Israel is going to get back into the land. But it is Jesus who meets that requirement. It is Jesus alone who gets into the land by that requirement. How is it that then we as believers enter into that promise? It's by being united to him by faith. And so we get what Jesus is get, which Jesus gets. Um, just to kind of give you a little bit of context, the significance for today, this, this is one of the, still one of the highly disagreed upon um, components in the Christian faith today among conservative evangelical Christians. So what I mean by that is just uh, people who intently believe the Bible is inerrant. They're going for to the Bible to find all the answers for faith all the answers about God, they take it as their wholehearted guide for every area of faith. And these, this group of Christians who will assent to that, those principles are coming to different conclusions about how the Old Testament relates to the New Testament. And they're coming to uh, very different practical implications of it. So, um, for example, I would bring out Romans 6.14. It says, sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So for the Christian life, it's very important to know what Paul means by not under law, but under grace. And it has everything to do about your daily battle against sin and to experience your joy in following Christ. And so if we as a church are coming to different conclusions about what it means to be under law versus under grace, it has significance for our, our daily lives as believers. And so this historical material has great relevance uh, for us still to, today. Um, see somebody say, would uh, Romans 7, 1, 6, would that relate to this discussion? Absolutely. That is uh, where Paul um, basically uh, gives a, a definition of how it is that Christians are no longer under the old covenant, but under the new. And he in Romans 7, 1 through 6, very much opposes those two covenants. At least it, in my opinion, and I would say in the opinion of Hope Elders, you'll find other Bible-believing Christians who um, would interpret how the Old Covenant relates to the New Covenant differently. And that's just something that's kind of outside of this class. You'll, you'll get to that when you uh, talk about systematic theology. I think you'll probably read some of Wayne Grudem uh, in, in your course studies. That'll be something that you'll pick up. Um, all right. Uh, early church history issues. Uh, I've got three of them here. I was not planning on being able to address them all in detail. Um, the one that I want to hit on uh, first is the one we'll spend the most time on. I think the other two I've left resources for you that you can kind of investigate yourself. I'll just briefly go over them. But I want to quickly look at this issue of persecution. And then I'm going to have you guys kind of break up into your small discussion groups and discuss one question and kind of come back to the larger group. So just persecution within the church. We see it evidenced in Acts from the beginning. We have Acts 8.1 where Paul is persecuting and has Stephen put to death. That leads to further persecution of Christians within Jerusalem. And they go out into the regions of Judea, Samaria. Um, we find out that they end up going... Uh, to Antioch as well. Um, we come to Acts chapter 12, and we see that Herod the king, who is basically uh, an authority of the Roman Empire, he uh, lays his hands on some of the Christians to persecute and mistreat them. Um, he even goes so far as to have James, the brother of John, put to death. And it says that when he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And continually persecute Christians. And if you look at church history of the 12 um, apostles, most of them are sort of that they died as martyrs. Um, so you have kind of within that context, um, this persecution going on. And, and in Acts 18 there, um, we have the event that I referenced to earlier where uh, Luke talks about um, Claudius giving this command that all the Jews leave, leave Rome. And most people believe there's this extra biblical reference to this edict by Claudius having the, all the Jews leave Rome. And the reason was because there was this 
uh, disagreement between the Jews about this person named Crestus, who most likely was, was Christ, just a misspelling um, of his name. And so uh, just kind of, again, a, a map context of that first century, we have the Roman, Roman Empire uh, occupying most of Northern Africa, Europe, and part of the uh, Middle East world. In Christianity by 300 AD, that kind of orange is representative of Christianity at 300 AD throughout this empire. But from the time of the Acts Church up until that uh, late 300 time period, where an uh, emperor named Constantine comes into power, um, throughout those uh, couple hundred years, Christians are experiencing ongoing persecution. And it's predominantly um, due to a couple of reasons. Um, one, Roman culture's worship of the gods and worship of Caesar as God. Uh, Christian, Christianity was in direct conflict with that. Um, <clears throat> and so during this period, the Roman Empire starts to wane in influence. And a lot of people uh, assert that it's because the Christians aren't worshiping these gods and the gods are then punishing the Roman Empire. And so they're seen as bad uh, citizens of the Roman Empire and um, really abhorrent. And then Christians also often refused to serve in the military, or if they did, and once they got on the battlefield, they might um, refuse to actually kill a human being. And so those aspects that was uh, characteristics that were happening within the Christian church um, caused, uh, in a lot of cases, was the reason for the persecution that they were experiencing. I'm just going to name a couple of uh, some high points of Christian persecution in that early history. Um, we have Nero in 64 AD. He's the emperor of the Roman Empire. And during his time, a uh, big fire breaks out in Rome. And the people at the time, uh, rumors spread up that Nero intentionally started the, the fire for his own amusement. And so this is causing... Uh, his constituents to dislike him. And so Nero looks for a scapegoat and he blames the Christians. And Tacitus, a historian, a historian at the time, he writes this, he says, before uh, killing the Christians, Nero used to amuse the people. Some were dressed in furs to be killed by dogs. Others were crucified. Still others were set on fire early in the night so that they might illuminate it. Nero opened his own gardens for these shows. And so just this um, very brutal, violent um, persecution of the Christians um, begins very early in the church history storyline. And it's interesting, if you even look at uh, a lot of the epistles that are written, um, almost uh, all of them mention Christians being persecuted. And it's, these are written to very young churches. Uh, take Philippi, for example. Um, where Paul is basically prepping them theologically to endure persecution. And it was like one of um, the, the main things you become a disciple of Christ early on, you learn about persecution and a theological response to it, which we're going to get to in just a second. Um, so we have Domitian, who's another Roman Empire, kind of, kind of continues um, this persecution of Christians. We have, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but Trajan, is a Roman Empire emperor. And during his time period, basically he's noticing that the economy is hurting because uh, in certain areas, Christianity is becoming so popular that it's hurting the economy of the temple sacrifices. And so uh, he kind of puts out this edict that um, Christianity itself becomes a crime and that when Christians are brought before the court, they are supposed to recant of their Christian faith confess worship in the Roman gods and in Caesar. And if they don't, they are to be punished, which often is punishment by, by death. And so this law um, from the time of uh, Trajan begins to be used against Christians to kind of further just justify uh, this persecution. And there's numerous stories throughout this first couple hundred years of the church of just Christians being brought before courts and their testimony that they give before these officials and how they don't back down, but uh, basically stare death in the face and willingly go, uh, go forward in a profession of faith to, to 
uh, experienced death as a martyr. And so um, a couple of famous ones is Ignatius of Antioch and Polycarp. And I think I made reference to some of Polycarp in the uh, pre-class study guide, but you can go online and research the background of these guys pretty easily. I just have a quote here from that, from that book. It says, this is a Polycarp. It says, after being threatened for a long time, in order to recant, the judge finally threatened Polycarp with burning him alive. Polycarp simply answered that the fire that the judge could light would only last a moment, whereas the eternal fire would never go out. Finally, we are told that after he was tied to the post in the pyre, he looked up and prayed out loud, Lord, sovereign God, I thank you that you have deemed me worthy of this moment so that jointly with your martyrs, I may have a share in the cup of Christ. For this, I bless and glorify you. Amen. And so just this idea, this thankfulness um, of being a martyr becomes a characteristic in, in these first couple centuries. In fact, their belief was that no one could endure in and of themselves, that it was only God who gave the power to uh, not recant their faith, to have the, the power to endure the torture and stay faithful to, to the end. And so it becomes a, a, a huge honor during this time period to become a martyr. Uh, this continues, like I said, with other Roman Empire emperors, um, Diocletian and Galliarius uh, kind of are the, the last two that are really heavily persecuting Christians before Constantine comes in, into power. All right, so the church has to have a theological understanding of suffering and a response because it's happening from the very moment that Christianity is going forth. Um, so I'm going to just uh, quick read uh, two texts here, Romans 8, 31 through 39. Paul is writing, he says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, he who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? <clears throat> will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, just as it is written? So Paul here quotes <clears throat> Psalm 44. He's saying that the persecution of the Christians are fulfilling this psalm. It says, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, so Paul is clearly just has an idea that Christians will endure persecution, but ultimately it's trivial in light of the promises of Christ and the surety of those promises. Uh, I want to quickly also look at Colossians 1, uh, 24. Uh, we're not going to read this whole thing, but just the first verse 24, Paul writes, and he's writing to a Gentile church. And he says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of the body, which is the church in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. And at first glance, that phrase probably almost seems heretical. What is lacking in Christ's afflictions? It would almost seem as if Christ's sacrifice on the cross isn't sufficient to bring about salvation. But that's not what Paul is saying or what he's getting at. Paul, rather, just, well, first of all, that word Christ just is the Greek word for anointed one. And what Paul is seeing is there's this theme throughout Scripture where God's anointed ones in the time period in which they live, they are always suffering to bring about God's redemptive purposes in history at that time period. For example, you have the prophets in the Old Testament who suffer in order to bring about God's uh, message to the people. They are persecuted and they are put to death. You obviously ultimately see it in Christ as he um, suffers the ultimate sacrifice, which is the only one, which is brings about penal substitutionary atonement for Christians. It is the sacrifice that 
establishes and secures salvation. But as we know from the storyline, in order for that salvation to be effective, that message needs to go out so that people can hear, repent, and believe. And that's what Paul is talking about in Romans 10. And so Paul is saying the afflictions, the afflictions that he's enduring are continuing this, this theme in Scripture of the anointed ones of, of God. So the anointed ones are those with the Holy Spirit. So that is all believers within the church now, in the church age. They go forward and they endure affliction to bring about God's redemptive purposes in history. And so we see that clearly in Paul's own life as he's enduring persecutions in order to bring the gospel message to these Gentile nations. So theologically, Paul sees this as God's means to bring about his redemptive purposes in the world. God's anointed ones always will suffer in order to bring about uh, God's kingdom. And we see that kind of referenced, uh, I have this quote by Tertullian at the uh, end of the page here, um, who's in the, um, again, those first 200 years, who I think himself was also becomes a martyr. And I, I believe I had some references to some of his writings in that pre-class handout. But he's basically making this comment that all throughout these first two centuries, as these Roman empires, emperors are putting these Christians to death, it's just leading to Christianity to grow. And that's kind of what that map represented that we saw earlier with all that orange that was spread out through the Roman Empire. Because as these pagan people look in upon these Christians and they're in the arena being put to death, and they see them give their testimony and they see them give their courage and how they face death and they don't back down, they, all they nearly meet, need to do is recant their faith and profess worship in the Roman gods and they'll be set free and they won't do it. And so this becomes a testimony to these pagan people who witness it and they start coming to faith. And Tertullian comments on that and he says, the blood of the martyrs was a seed for the more it was spilled, the greater the number of Christians. And so he's just making a comment uh, about the reality of Christian suffering, bringing about the kingdom of God for the church at that time. Um, all right, we have 15 minutes left. Um, I want you guys to get in groups and just for 10 minutes, discuss this question. And then we'll just quickly talk about it for five minutes. But at hope we have just been through a series titled the gospel changes everything. Um, during that series, uh, we use a triangle to describe how the church is to pursue gospel ministry in the world. One, be biblically faithful two countercultural and three, be culturally relevant. Um, in the midst of the context of Christian persecution in the first through third centuries, the church grew rapidly. So my question is, what made the church culturally relevant in the first and third centuries? So granted, this involves a little bit of speculation, but I don't think it's too much of a stretch. Like why is this group who professes this certain faith is experiencing this great persecution. How are they fulfilling this kind of third leg of the triangle that we talked about during this whole sermon series, being culturally relevant? What was it about this group of Christians that was relevant to the culture of their time? And so um, I forgot we were supposed to have a, a question period. Um, maybe try to wrap up in five minutes, just break out in your groups. Um, and come back, let's say at 7.50, and we'll just talk about it for five minutes, and maybe have five minutes of questions. Uh, Norm, can you throw that question into the chat? Like, can you copy and paste it really uh, quick for them? Uh, I can. Can you, uh, yep, I have to stop sharing the PowerPoint, but uh, I don't think that'll be a big deal. Okay. Oh, someone screenshotted it for you. Never mind. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. All right, I'll send you guys into your breakouts.
Matt, you're in Adams, Austin. Awesome. Uh, if we go a little over norm two, that's okay. Um, it just you just I have don't... to pay a fine. <laughs> <laughs> Send all fines to Steve at hopecc.com. Yeah. Uh, I think answering at least the woman question would be a good one, but if that's the only Q and A we get to, then can um... you repost that question? Yep. For me. I think the impetus is if circumcision was the mark of the covenant, does that mean women weren't in the covenant? Oh, okay. You know what David Roos says? No, I don't. Circumcision doesn't cut it. <laughs> <laughs> It's not a, it's not, it's a, it's a Bible joke. <laughs> it's a Bible joke. It's not a bad joke. That should be the vendetta. Norm, I, I was told you were going to just dog the new perspective for two hours, so I'm a little disappointed. No, uh -oh. I'm just kidding. I thought the way you handled that was really good. I did too, yeah. Just pointing out, you know, we want to start with the Bible and not, and then let, let's do some exegesis. But that makes me feel less smart, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just have to discover what's in the text instead of... Always uh, getting your his history books out. Yeah. Kaylin, did you make that blanket? I did. Oh, that's Jamie's off camera. I wasn't ready for it. You guys, but can I just tell you how sad I am? I, like, made it not wide enough. Okay, but... I did the same thing. And so I redid mine because it wasn't wide enough. <laughs> oh, Which was that, is, um, that, is, that is commitment to redo it. It was definitely a lot of commitment. I first did it too tight, and then I got like maybe a third of the way through, and I was like, this is way too tight. And then I did it oh. again, did it all the way through, and I was like, oh, no, it's too narrow. <laughs> it is way narrow. Like, it is really only like a cap, like a throw blanket because... I grabbed mine. It doesn't. Mm, I'm so sad. And there's some holes in it too. Like I didn't do the stitching right in some places. <laughs> so I've had to like tie random knots. But. Kaylin, what, oh, well. what was the snack game tonight? I saw you had something. Well, I had dinner. Yeah, saw that. And then um, I have molasses cookies at home. Oh, I like your color. Yeah. And yours has like a design to it too. So it's the same as yours, except for I just every three rows I turned it around. Yeah. Oh, that's smart. So yeah, it was a fun experiment. It was the only color I could find at the time, which is kind of crazy. Oh well yeah, I had this. I like a friend that works at a craft store and so she just had gray or black. I was like, I don't really want black blanket. So it was teal, or there was like a red, like a really bright. Oh. Red. I was like, eh. <laughs> I like the teal. It's pretty. Thanks. Yeah, kind of fun. It's cool. warm for sure, but yeah. I wish, in my mind, I'm like, I wish she would have told me that I made it too long. How many loops did you do wide? Um, two. Four, five, six, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen. Hold on, fourteen, probably twenty-two. Okay. Twenty. Yeah, I think mine's <laughs> thirty. So the first oh. one I did twenty, and I was like, ah. <laughs> so. I, yeah, that's how I feel about it. I like it though. Thanks. Yeah. 
I didn't have to pay for it. So that's where I'm like, eh, I can't like complain about it too much. <laughs> so it's fun. Yeah. We watched Little Women while we did it and cried. <gasps> have you guys seen that movie? I haven't seen it, but I got asked on our honeymoon if I was one of the actresses, so that was pretty funny. Really? <laughs> oh my goodness, so... Yeah, Saoirse mm -hmm. Ronan, like, I don't, yeah, I don't see that I look a ton like her, but... We, we were... Is that Joe? I haven't seen the movie, so I'm not sure. Oh. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can finish the story. Uh, Sorry, yeah. Oh, quick. just, yeah. We're on this train, and it's kind of like a, a booze train, like you go through these rocks, you know, see kind of some neat uh, scenery, and stuff. scenery and stuff but there's like a bar and but there's a bar and and so a lot of people are are kind of tipsy or whatever and there's this group of ladies uh sitting next to us who kind of keep kind of whispering and they ask jamie questions you know periodically throughout this trip and like one of them's like oh i can't remember how it came up but jamie replies she goes yeah i lived in la for a while which she did where she went to pt school and yeah so, yeah like during this dialogue, these facts keep coming out that would seem to support the idea that she actually is this actress from Little Women. And so like, <laughs> finally one of those, <laughs> of those women uh, and asked. This her. one. Yeah. Yeah, I could see it for sure. And I had like my only water bottle. So she's like, oh, the Ellen show. I'm like, oh yeah, I've been a couple times. You know, she's just <laughs> That's really funny. Right. Yeah. Uh, so how does this work? Do they just come back or do we have to? Yeah. And it looks like they come back. Sorry, we were talking about Little Women for all of you who are <laughs> joining us. All right. Um, feel free to, on this one, to maybe unmic yourself and just kind of report back what you're group discussed um if you'd rather do it in the group chat i'll try and read it but feel free to do do either or our group brought up a couple points just like with the culture they were under roman oppression and so not only like yes christians were being persecuted and they were targeted but they're like the other people um, were also being under oppression, like they were had to follow this strict Roman law. And so just showing them that there was somebody that they could follow that wasn't going to oppress them like that, I think is one way that we talked about that they were being culturally relevant. Um, and then even just during that time, like they would get a new ruler and then he would die and then they'd get another new ruler and they never knew how this ruler was going to be. Was he going to be crazy like Nero? Um, was he going to be super oppressive? Um, whereas like Jesus, he's that ruler that is consistent and he's not an oppressor. Like he cares for his people and he's going to rule with love. So mm -hmm. those are the two kind of things we th talked about. Great. Anybody else? I'm gonna nominate a guys group to go. So you guys can duke it out on who's gonna answer. All right, no one? I'll just, <laughs> uh, hopefully you guys had some good discussions and that was the, the point of it. Um, I think it's very important, uh, just kind of what Hope was, was bringing up about how do we engage our world with the gospel? Because the gospel does change everything, right? Romans 1, 16 through 17 says, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And so the thing that I think is uh, kind of picking up, I'm sorry, I'm hovering over your window to try and get your name, but. I don't see it, but whatever the, the lady said earlier, um, 
I agree with. So just this idea that uh, hope in Jesus is kind of what I, I just want to phrase it. But in addition to that was just this idea of um, there was nothing else that this community had to gain other than their belief in Jesus and in the afterlife and that he was going to come back and establish his kingdom. And so um, outside of that idea, there's nothing of relevance this community had for the pagan cultures. They had nothing to offer them. What made them culturally relevant was the gospel. And so our mission, like as we're trying to be culturally relevant to the people around us, the way we do that is we have to show them why the gospel is relevant for their lives. And by Christians willing to, to die, to suffer extreme persecution for no other reason, there could be no reason under heaven that they would do this other than the fact that they believed in their, to their core, that this was real reality, that their hope was laid up in the afterlife and not in this life. It testified to their surety and even the power of their God like as these pagans people look on and see them endure this kind of suffering, many of them come to the conclusion that the only way they could endure this was if indeed their God was real. Um, and so as the Christian church had this apologetic for why they were suffering, and then the pagan cultures looked in upon it. And so I think for me, the big lesson I take home as far as how to live all of my life and be culturally relevant is just this idea that the gospel is what makes us culturally relevant. And a lot of times the culture doesn't understand that. And that idea isn't relevant to them at the time. And so it's only by God's power that one, it can become relevant. But two, much of our mission of Christians to be culturally relevant is to uh, primarily in word, but also in deed, show its relevance for our life and their, thereby show its relevance in their life. Anyways, um, the last two items that we didn't get to uh, were um, basically uh, this idea of the hermeneutics. Like um, if Jesus and his church are the fulfillment to all these Old Testament prophecies, there's this problem of how did, how was it that all these people missed this? Uh, for all these centuries like Jesus is on the scene and the Pharisees and the scribes who are very studied in scriptures are not seeing him as a fulfillment of the scriptures so the question then becomes how is it that one would see this what is the hermeneutical principles by which we can read our Old Testaments and understand this to be true and so you kind of have two different schools of thought develop one in Alexandria which is kind of a northern city or a city in northern Africa which was a uh, an academic center of the Roman world, one of the academic centers, not the, but one of the academic centers. And so they kind of developed this allegory method. I'll leave it up to you guys to kind of investigate what that is. Uh, Antioch, which is uh, referenced in, in Acts, that's where Paul and Barnabas go, um, are sent out of. That church also has a prominent Christian school. So Antioch and Alexandria kind of are the two prominent er areas developing Christian theology during this early 200s and they kind of develop a different hermeneutical principle that's much more historical grammatical kind of considered literal but instead of allegory they have this concept of typology and i'm sure you'll be exposed to that hopefully as if you haven't already been into ldir for when you take some hermeneutical courses but that's just something of interest um, to, to possibly read some first century texts and see how are they answering the question of um, the New Testament's interpretation of the Old Testament? Um, and I should quickly just say, I left some references on your pre-class homework. Um, I actually disagree with the conclusions of that uh, one author. I think his name is Peter Enns. I think he was asserting that um, the goal of the New Testament authors in trying to find Christ in the Old Testament is a the same goal we should take on as modern day readers, but his assertion was we can't copy their exegetical methods. And I would just kind of uh, present to you that that really doesn't make sense of the history we find in Acts then, that if they were employing methods 
of exegesis that weren't um, acceptable to the culture at their time, then nobody would have accepted Christianity as the answer to um, the Old Testament text. And you, you find stuff like in Acts where Paul comes into the Bereans and he presents his presentation of the gospel and it says the Bereans were more excellent than this other city that they intently went back to the scriptures to check and see if everything Paul said really was true. And so scripture is our, our guide for every matter of faith, including and probably most importantly for how to read the Bible. And so, yes, it's confusing at times how uh, New Testament authors quote the Old Testament, but if you really want to learn how to read your Bible, that's one of the most fruitful things you can do is actually uh, just stop and pause. And you're probably not going to get it the first, fourth, fifth, or tenth time understanding it. It's going to be a journey. But really, as you're devotionally reading uh, the Bible, pay close attention to how authors quote earlier parts of Scripture and just ask, what is what are the hermeneutical principles? Hermeneutical principles just mean principles of study, principles of uh, how, how we should read it. Like, what, are, what concepts are they using to, to interpret it? Uh, the last thing was just kind of the Gnostic and Marcion heresies. Um, they were early heresies that kind of presented themselves in the culture of the time that the church had to uh, react against. They react in three primary ways. Um, one, they start to develop a canon of authoritative texts because Marcionism was rejecting some of the texts and editing or redacting other texts. So they kind of start to develop a canon. Um, two, they start to systematize their faith to develop uh, principles of faith that counteract these uh, heretical principles that were being developed. So uh, you have this Apostles' Creed being developed that kind of uh, talks about uh, foundational principles of the faith. And then the third kind of predominant way that the early church responds to these heresies is that they develop this principle of apostolic succession. And the idea there is just um, both uh, Gnosticism and Marcionism talked about the secret knowledge that was handed down. And so you kind of needed to go into these faith systems and, and progress and, and gain this secret knowledge in order to be saved. And the church confronted that saying, if there was this secret knowledge, then obviously Jesus was the one who had the secret knowledge. He would have disseminated it to his apostles and those apostles would have disseminated it to their disciples. And so basically what the early church said is, look, we have this group of disciples that can trace their discipleship back to the apostles, who, you know, obviously come from Jesus. And all of them unanimously assert that there is no secret knowledge, that the, these uh, religions of Gnosticism and Marcionism, that they're asserting that there's a secret knowledge, they're refuting. And so just this idea that the church could uh, – show their succession back to the apostles gave them um, the apologetic answer against uh, some of these heretical movements. Um, so you can use the study guide to kind of investigate that more. I just kind of want to expose you to those ideas so you guys have an opportunity to study more if you want to. There's just too much history to try and cover in uh, two hours. And you'll come back to a lot of this as you study systematic and biblical theology. So it's kind of uh, a lot of these disciplines overlap. And so it's just, will hopefully be a journey of just kind of learning and, and growing. Um, we did have one question um, that I'm going to address. Just uh, Keelan reposted. I don't know who asked it, but circumcision implies only men were a part of this promise. Any reason why women were left out of the covenant here uh, could have been anything else but chose circumcision. So part of my answer would be, um, one, the text really doesn't comment on that question directly. But we do know culturally, um, at the time, men were kind of seen as um, uh, of a different status than women. And so there really was no need to prescribe the boundaries of women because women were always associated to community through men as predominantly associated to community through men you do have those instances and that becomes an issue in first century churches like widows who don't have that as association to the community through men and you find the church caring for them um, 
this is going to be for sure an incomplete answer. But the other aspect I would say is I don't think it could be anything that God could have chose. I think he did choose specifically circumcision for the primary reason that um, the gospel promise shows up in the storyline. So the gospel promise being what we know, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He's the savior. He's ascended in power. He's going to come back, establish his kingdom. That whole reality starts out in this kernel promise back in Genesis 3.15, where it says a seed of the woman will come and crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And so in the storyline, there becomes this word that becomes very theologically important, and that word is seed. And it's referencing uh, just, sorry, this little graphical, but human seed. And so just the idea of the way humans are fruitful and multiply. And so uh, a lot of theologians, I think, are probably correct. Circumcision, in a lot of ways, is a direct reference to this idea of the seed will come. And so pointing back to this, this promise. And so rather than making it, you know, a red ribbon on your cloak, um, circumcision was a pointing back to this promise that started out as one from the seed of the woman, gets refined as a seed of Abraham, further gets refined as a seed from, from David. Um, so I understand why you would say anything. And, and yes, God can do anything. I don't want to uh, refute that. But I think God specifically chose that sign as a reference back to um, the promise. Any other questions that people want to throw out? I know we're over time, 807. So anybody can feel free to drop off, I think. I guess Kaylin should maybe give that permission. Um, Do you want to answer the follow-up real quick? Uh, so would women have been excluded in the covenant through your husband's father? Yes. So women would have um, been included. And we see um, even widows uh, being included, in a sense, in the covenant community. Um, like you go to Ruth. Um, where there's provisions made for the, uh, what um, is supposed to happen in the family line so that to every possible extent, they still have an attachment through a male. And even when they don't, um, they are still uh, given some provision within the community. But for sure, I mean, uh, the culture was very patriarchal back then, and it's easy to understand how that would have been a natural outcome of fallen humanity in a sense of, um, dominance by physical characteristics. But then we also, and this is just kind of outside of this class, we do have God giving different roles to the, to the sexes, male and female. And so um, I'm not asserting that that was God, how it played out in culture was God's intention for those different roles. I think that's a, a perversion of those roles where women did predominantly uh, end up suffering as um, in their role. Um, but there, it is biblical for, for there to be different roles, but still a part of the same community. Huge topic, way, way more than I can answer, but great, great question too. I don't wanna just dismiss it. All right. Well, thank you, Norm, for diving into Acts with us. That was a lot of good information. And even just to kind of um, reiterate what he said about, um, just learning how to study the Bible just makes it so much more like when I, I guess when I do it and looking at the cross references, if I'm having a hard time understanding what a text means and seeing where else they might talk about it at script in scripture is really helpful for me um, because it, it just brings to light more of what God is doing. And so um, cross references, study Bibles are helpful and things of the sort. So um, just a couple announcements to wrap up the night. Um, the first one being is we have a retreat coming up. Um, it will be all the month of January. Um, so we will, some of you may have gotten your, uh, retreat kits already. I made a few stops along with, um, Catherine and I know Paul is heading out this week. Um, and in there you will have your book for next session along with some snacks, um, just because snacks make things better, at least in our opinion. Um, and so we want you, 
also to be creative with your retreat kit and make an Instagram worthy post um, and post your picture on Canvas and then we will vote and the winner will get, um, I don't know yet, but for sure a high five. So <laughs> we will start there. Um, and let's see what else. The retreat will be made available on January 8th. Um, and then you'll have until January 29th to complete it. Um, so hopefully that will give you enough time to, to do all the videos at once. Um, and then leaders, I would just maybe set your own deadline for your group so that when you guys choose to discuss, then they will know kind of when to be ready. Um, each video will be 15, 20 minutes long, so they aren't too long. Um, and it's all just like different moments in church history. Um, and then the other announcement is in January and then at least through March or April, we're going to be hosting game nights for off-roaders, um, just once a month, probably for, I don't know, an hour and a half-ish. Paul and I are still working out the details. All we know is that this is something we want to do just to gather you guys and have fun. Um, and so we will keep you posted on that. The first one will be, um, middle of January. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, and I think that's it. So I will pray to close us out. And then yeah, thank you again, Norm for coming. Woo! It was awesome. Yeah, props to everyone for enduring uh, zoom learning and LDI Afro that's uh, that takes some dedication. So props. Yeah. All right, please pray with me. Uh, Father, we are grateful um, just for you, Lord, for the work that you have done from the beginning and the way that you have uh, revealed yourself through the scriptures and then have um, given us Jesus as a representation, Lord, of who you are. Um, thank you for the way that um, you have faithfully brought your scriptures throughout history, um, that we can be bearers of your good news today. And so we ask God that you would help us to um, just even in this Christmas season, as we might be seeing family or whatever way that looks like, that we'd be able to proclaim your good news um, and share that with others. Um, Lord, we love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good night, friends. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. All yeah, right. Stop, stop recording. Oh, yeah. Lindsay Wenzel had to remind me. <laughs> <laughs>